Hello. Yeah. Great. Um, thanks for showing up. Um, my talk's about from imperative to functional APIs. The logo says it's from C to OCaml, but that's not really necessary. You can go from any imperative language ever to any functional language. This is not that much language specific. So no worries. Um, thanks, guys, for showing up. I'm uh, Mario Kubica. Um, first, I want to say a little bit, um, because I'm a university student and there's a company called Style Fruits. They sponsored me getting here and um, staying in Bologna. So thanks to them. Um, there's a guy from Style Fruits um, speaking right now um, at uh, the Currying Hall at 11. So if you get the chance, uh, watch his recording. And he's holding a workshop at 2 PM. So if you're interested in learning closure, uh, just go there. Thanks. Um, OK. About me, I'm, uh, as I said, a university student at the TUM, which is the Technical University of Munich. Um, I'm a big fan of free software, and um, I tried just about every language ever because that's very much fun for me. Um, and I got started with OCaml by this poster, which said, uh, wanted only alive OCaml programmers uh, from my thesis advisor. And he was looking for people, so I just applied to him. And he said, well, I'm looking for some things to be done in OCaml. Um, and he was looking for a compression library. Because data compression support in OCaml kind of sucked. And he said, I need some features for this. So can you please implement them? Um, OK, so I thought, great, let's try it. So I used libarchive, which is a C library for uh, data compression. And I used the OCaml foreign function interface to speak to it um, as a bachelor thesis. And the OCaml's uh, lib archive library has a very C-like API with handles, with functions, but it's rather ugly to use if you if you um, used um, languages like OCaml, Python, or something else. It's tedious. So I decided to also. Uh, make a better API, but the question is, what is a better API anyway? Um, so my goal for today is to show you that you can use kind of advanced type uh, system features to help you in your everyday work, um, and that they're not only academic, that they can be used in real life code, not in uh, cute examples for slides on uh, conferences. <laughs> OK, here, uh, there's a type signature of static typing the C way. Um, these are two functions from the libarchive API. You see on the left the um, return type, which is a pointer to a struct. Uh, you see the function name, and you see the argument type, which is void in, in both cases. They return you a pointer to a struct, which represents uh, basically an opened archive um, for from which you can read and write. You see, also, um, both of these pointers are of the same type. They're also they're both um, struct archive pointer, which means you can basically interchange them, but it's not a good idea. OK, we got these handles, right. Um, but what can we do with these handles? So we have created the ha handles, and we can um, open them, which means we pass an archive to it. We can configure them, because um, with an archive, you have to say uh, what kind of type the, the data is. Maybe it's a zip file, maybe it's a tarball, maybe it's compressed with LZMA, whatever. So you have to configure them first. Then you can read from them. Or if it's a, a writable archive, you can write to them. And you can also close them. But that's nice. But what if, if we screw up? Because we saw the type of both read and write handles was exactly the same. So you could basically read from a write handle or write to a read handle. So what that happens? Well, it segfaults. That's not nice. It compiles, but it segfaults. Or it looks like this. Well, not so fun to debug, especially if the program is bigger than a um, just testing program. Um, what actually should happen is um, that libarchive returns a special value called archive fatal. Uh, it's a special return value when something's broken, you, you messed up the types. But unfortunately, um, sometimes bugs happen also in libarchive, and well, it segfaults again. So maybe we can do better. Maybe we can do better. Um, so what can you do wrong? 
there's reading from a handle that's not open. That's, that's possible because you have the type and you can read from it. And, um, or you can write to a read handle. Not too nice either because that just doesn't work. Or you can forget to set the options. You forgot to, con uh, to configure that you're writing from a zip file and garbage comes out. Um, this actually happens. I was debugging for two hours before I figured out that um, my handle is just not open. Okay, but libarchive is not a bad library. I'm, I'm complaining about it, but it's actually a pretty decent library. It's just how things are in C. The, the um, APIs are kind of fragile. You have to really think what you're doing with your types. You cannot just uh, hope for your runtime to catch your problems, hope for your compiler to, to help you with that. But maybe we can do better now. Well, yes, obviously. That's why we're here. Um, but what can we do better? OK. Um, let's try with some simple steps. Um, to interface with a C library in OCaml, you have to define your, um, your functions in this way. You have to say, well, it's external. And then you have a, new hand, a read new handle function. And it takes a unit, which is basically like void or nothing. And it returns you an archive. That's, that's how it looks like. And it calls a function, a C function called OST read new. Um, OK, but we can also define types for handles now. We can define our read handle to be of archive. Archive is an opaque type which just contains the, the pointer, the struct pointer that we had earlier from the C library. Um, and the right handle, we can just make it something else. We can say, well, it's an archive plus some two pointers which are useful for, um, uh, for working with the C library. But what you see, the not, it's not important what the types actually are, but that they are distinct, that the read handle is different from the write handle. So. We cannot, read, uh, we cannot read from uh, write handles and we cannot write to read handles now because the compiler just said, well, no, it just doesn't work because you have different types and uh, you cannot do this. OK, but that's, that's kind of kinda trivial um, because you can do that in C2. You can just define different types and say, well, they're different now. Um, but we can do better because as we saw, the the handles have different ways uh, to work with them. And they have different states. When you create them, they're in a new state. And you can then, the most sensible or only sensible thing to do is to first configure them. And when you have configured them, when you have said, well, this is a zip file, this is a um, tarball, then you can open a file. And open means um, it, you attach it to a file name and you can read from that. And once it opens, you can read and write to it, OK? But then you also have to close it. And they're in a closed state. So that's nice. So we have handles, and we know that there are states. But let's hope we can kind of uh, put it together into one. For this, um, we need to add the state information to the type. And how to do this? Um, well, OCaml has parameterized types, uh, which you can see here. So you get a list, and it's a list, but it doesn't say which type it is. So it's a uh, quote A list, which means it's basically anything. It's like in Haskell, the A type annotations. And if you put something in, it's an int list. And you can also define your own types to be the same way. So you can have a type quote A read handle, which says, well, it's a read handle of some, some type. It works kind of like generics. And OK, so now we have a way to parameterize our types. So we define the types that we, ha uh, that we want to parameterize. And we have seen these um, four states that the um, handle can have. So let's define a new type, which is a state uh, of a handle. And we say, well, it's a, an, either a new handle, or a configured, or an opened, or even a closed handle. But we have these four types, but what if we want to extend it? Well, you cannot just reopen a type and add new constructors to it, like here. Um, but Okama has a, diff uh, a new feature 
which is called the open union types. They're also called sometimes polymorphic variants, which is basically you define a type as a set. And you have these constructors. They're called new. They're currently configured, opened, and closed. And you can add um, more constructors as you wish. But the problem is, um, OK, let's, let's do this like this. OK, we have um, a read function. We want to read from an archive. So we call the read function. And we have to say this read function only works on a read handle, OK? And it only works if the read handle is actually in open state. So let's try it. But it doesn't work, unfortunately, because the OCaml compiler is rather smart. And if you attach uh, a type and you don't use it, um, the OCaml compiler just optimizes the way. And he says, well, um, you can require to, for it to be an of open type, but the OCaml compiler knows that it's equivalent to any other type of read handle. So it just accepts any other type too. So when you try to pass it a closed read handle, it works as well. So we have to t uh, hide this thing that these types are um, the same in a special way. Um, and it works. We define a handle. This is the module thing. Um, we define the signature, and we create a new. Um, we we um, create a function. This is the signature of the new function for a handle. And it, it takes a unit, and it returns a new read handle. And um, we define our read handle function to take this uh, quote A type and return um, and to, to be this function. And then this is the function that we, we're doing. It's, it's calling OSC read new. And now it's, we can always, we can know that it takes um, an, a unit and it returns an open handle. So what we did here is um, we improved the type safety by actually making um, illegal st states a type error. You cannot read from an, a closed handle anymore. You cannot um, configure an uh, opened handle anymore. That's nice. Um, OK. Let's try something else now. That's nice. We, we, this is the first step. That's good already. Um, have you ever seen this? Well, um, that's not so nice to get an error at runtime. Or have you ru uh, used Java, where you get uh, null pointer exceptions sometimes? Or um, used C, where you, when you don't check for null pointers, you get um, sec faults? Well, you know whose fault is this? It's not your fault. It's the fault of null, and none, and null, and nil, and whatever they are called. So. Um, so every time you try to use nil, um, every time you use nil, you get to check whether you got nil or something else. And if you forget, then bad things might happen if you don't check. But maybe they don't happen because you, you never use the value. But so it's it's you have to really be careful wh what values you are getting and uh, to check for them. And. Um, it's annoying, and most people forget it, and that's why we get all these n uh, null pointer exceptions and errors and sec faults. So let's try to kill the null pointer. Um, there's two ways to do this. Null pointers are often the values when you get no result from it back. So that's the usual approach is to use exceptions. Um, we have exceptions everywhere. We have them in uh, Python, and Ruby, in uh, C++. We even have them in OCaml, but we don't use them that much. Um, they're easy to understand. If you, if you get an error, you just write this exception, and that's it. Um, but unfortunately, they're not type safe. You, unless you uh, consider checked exceptions, you don't know if the function is returning an exception or not. You ju it just happens, and you have to write your code and then run it, and then maybe it throws an exception or not, but maybe it all only throws an exception later. So you never know if you handled all cases. 
So that's rather boring. Um, let's try a different way. So null is always, if you have a function and it returns a value, it might return null. And null is often used as a marker. So you know, this is not a proper value. This is just some placeholder because we couldn't compute the proper value. Um, so let's try to use a type for this. And we define our type. We call it option. Actually, this type is already built in into a comma, but never mind. This is the definition of the type. So it's either some value, for example, a result of the computation, or it's none, which means, well, there was no value to be computed because, for example, you tried to divide by zero and the result is not some number. It's just none because we can com compute it. So every time a function returns an option type, we have to do pattern matching. This is nice because um, by this we know that we really handled the null case. So for example, we have a function which is called optional. And it takes an x, and it just returns an option type of, of uh, the same type. So if you want to get back to our number, we have to do this pattern matching, which looks like this. So you match optional 42, this is the function call, with, and then you have the constructors that you want to match on. So you know, OK, um, if it's none, we always return a valid value, in, in this case, 0. So we know that if something went wrong, we have to have a code path that handles this. Um, and if we forget, well, it's a type error. Um, because the compiler won't let you compile it. Because it says, well, you try to use this type A, but it's of type option A. And it won't work. So you have to do the pattern matching. You cannot forget it just. Um, this is nice. But sometimes just returning none is not enough. Sometimes you want to return the reason for an error. Like with, ex with exceptions. You always have uh, exceptions of specific types, so you know what kind of error happened. Can we do this here too? Yeah, we can. Um, we can define a different type. We call it, let's call it error. And it can be of two types. It can either be a success of an, of an, uh, oops. It can either be successful when it returns the value that you're wanting of type A, or it can be a failure of a different type. Nice. Um, let's try to do this with a function called uh, first functions. They always return success or failure. And we have a first function, and then we call a second function, and we call a third function. And we always have to pattern match. Well, um, this looks rather messy. You probably agree. And it just gets deeper and deeper the more you, uh, you pattern match. So, well, that's not good. But maybe we can simplify. And uh, indeed, so um, at the time I was reading a book on Haskell and I thought, well, this is interesting because this is very similar. Um, in, in Haskell, the option type is called the maybe monad. And the error type that I defined is called the error monad. Oh, wait. Oh, bam, scary monads. But maybe you can learn from it, uh, something from this. Um, yes, and indeed we can learn something from this because there's an interesting operator that works on these types. It's called the bind operator. And it works kind of like a chaining operation. So it takes um, an error monad of a type and a function that takes the type and returns um, an error monad of that type, of a different type. Um, and then it just returns that type. So it works kind of like an unwrapper function. So you pass in your your um, computation that might fail here, the function, the code that you want to execute here in a function, and it just returns this thing. Well, OK. Um, and the definition of bind for this error monad is just very simple. It, it is three lines of code. It just defines this bind operation, and then it says, oh, if it's, if it's um, let's match on this value. And if it's a success, then we just call the function with the success that we get past. 
And if not, we just pass it on. We just, the, the error, if an error happened already, we just pass the error through. So to uh, emulate the code from earlier, we can just use this code. We just do the match, and then you, we got the first function, and we bind it to the second function, and then we bind it to the third function, and then we just have to do the pattern mat matching at the end. OK. OK. But it's not really pretty. Maybe we can, we can improve it a little bit. And actually, um, we do. Because we can define custom operators. And we ju can just define this equal, uh, greater greater equals sign, which is the canonical uh, operator name for bind, which is also in the Hessel logo. And we can just say, well, this, this operator is now the bind operator. So we can just rewrite our code. And it's now very easy. It just takes a first function, and then this first function might uh, succeed or return an, a failure, and then pass it to the second function. If the second function, that might also succeed or return an error. But we don't have to adjust the second function to, to uh, care about the uh, success or error. We just can assume that it's successful, and if not, well, then the bind operator takes care of just passing on the error. And the same thing with the third function. And at the end, we just have to see, did our com computation complete successfully? Yes or no, maybe. And if not, there's a failure, and we can, well, see what the failure was. The, the uh, error message is passed here. In this case, we just ignore it. We just say failure in chain. But if, if it fails in some place, you can, you can get your uh, error right here. Um, okay. So, what, what did you do here? We actually um, made error handling now statically typed. We can be sure that uh, if an error happens, we really catch it and we really work with it. So, we don't have null pointer failures in runtime. And we also have an easy and convenient way to get the failures. We don't have to call some error functions from the library and see what the last error was. We just get it for free. But sometimes errors do happen. And we saw earlier we just use strings. But strings are really bad for, for making sure that uh, errors, uh, what the error was, what the reason for the error was. For example, um, we got a function called div divide a by b. It just takes the b, and if, it's, if the b is 0, it just returns a failure. Or if it's not, it just returns a success of a divided by b. Um, and we have a function that handles user input. It just reads an integer from a standard input and calls the divide function with 42 divided by whatever the user supplied. And it might be a success with a result of a number. Then we just print in a, a string with the number, or we just, um, or it might be a failure. If it's division by zero, then we say, well, divide it by zero, and it doesn't work. Um, but who can spot the error? Someone else? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that that too. But but it's yeah, that's that's going in the right direction. But what what exactly is the problem here in this code? Yes, exactly. The the string that we're matching is different. But the compiler can warn you that the cases are not all matched. But it cannot say what cases are even valid because it knows there's empty strings and there's non-empty strings, but not what kind of uh, values the empty uh, the string can have. Um, so yeah. We see the, the signature of this function is taking an integer, another integer, and it returns an integer with the result or a type of string. And string is really a bad type for, uh, conf uh, for adding information about errors because you don't know what errors are possible. So um, let's def uh, define an error, a possible error type for this failure. And well, Let's call it division error, for example. 
And well, division can have multiple errors. I was thinking, well, it can be division by zero, which is an error, or it can also maybe overflow um, or underflow. But and it's it's nice. You can return it, and then the compiler can say, well, you you caught the division by zero error, but you didn't uh, catch the overflow error. You should add the definition for it. But it's this is this works. But it doesn't really scale, because, for example, we have multiplication too, and you uh, want to say, well, multiplication has also some errors. Obviously, it doesn't have the division by zero error because that would be silly. Uh, but it can maybe overflow. So I got these two types, and then the compiler says, well, nah, that doesn't work either because you have defined overflow to be of type division error, and now you're trying to use it as a type of multiplication error. Um, so it doesn't compile. Um, but we can we can just use polymorphic variants again. We can just um, define division error as a set operation, as a kind of set of um, constructors. So um, we just use the division by zero um, type. You see, you see you see this tick, which means um, this is a polymorphic variant, and you can just compose your own types as as a set operation. You just add more types to the set, and then it's the, the type is just the set of the uh, constructors that you added. And you can also construct multiple sets with, with the same uh, constructor names. And this is quite convenient because OCaml constructs these types um, by itself. We can define them, but if you use it in a function, it the type of the function is exactly what you're returning. So let's just fix the program. And well, this is the same program, but this time we're not returning a, uh, a string as, an, uh, as the error, but we use this polymorphic variant called uh, division. And we divide it, and we do the same thing, but now the compiler can really say, well, you forgot this specific case. You're not forgetting to match a string, you, you forgot to match this division thing. Um, and you can see it from the signature. It also takes two integers, and at top, uh, um, it might be an int, which is the, which is the result that you're actually wanting. But also in the error case, it returns a different type. It says, well, it's division. And if it had, if you had more cases saying, well, this uh, thing is too big, let's return an overflow. It would be also um, displayed here. So the compiler can say, well, you, you forgot this thing. OK, that's nice. Um, we got a new achievement. The, every time we have an error, we can reflect it in the type system. So it will always return. Uh, your, your code is always be sure to handle all cases, which is very nice. So you don't just get errors on runtime. Um, but how we, can we continue from here? Okay, we can, we can also continue from here. The, the theme in the whole presentation is to make legal things not representable. So you cannot represent null anymore because there's no null. There's just an option type. And you always have to handle both cases. There's also no string. Um, no, no invalid string message. There's a um, polymorphic variant, so you can um, be sure that you're matching all cases. And that's, that's a general theme. It's making legal state unrepresentable. And it can continue on. There's, uh, for example, a concept called generalized algebraic data types, which you can also use for further restricting your valid types. But this, this just goes too far for this presentation. It's just, I just wanted to mention it. Um, also, APIs might turn actually too complicated, so um, nobody will be ever able to use the library because it's so complicated that you don't know how, where to even start. So please use common sense, or um, if you don't know what, uh, if you're not sure about common sense, you can just emulate idioms from uh, well-designed libraries in your preferred programming language. Um, Yes. So uh, we're this far. Um, 
If you have questions, uh, please be sure to raise them and um, otherwise I'm happy to uh, be able to present you this topic. Sure. Um, so recently we've heard a lot of problems with C APIs and security issues, right? Where there's unexpected things have happened and they've caused like really disastrous errors. Do you think these kind of techniques could be used either as wrappers or even with lower level languages like Rust to make these kind of unexpected errors rarer? Um, yeah, I think so, definitely. Um, there's um, um, recently from the University of Cambridge uh, a project called Mirage OS, which is basically an operating system written in OCaml. And they have a, um, a TLS implementation for written purely in OCaml with a little bit of code in C, which is, uh, which is really nice because it just avoids many, many, many errors that the OpenSSL library suffers from. So you've heard basically every week there's a new vulnerability in OpenSSL. And the guys who wrote uh, OCaml TLS were like, oh yeah, that's nice. Our library wasn't, hasn't had this bug from the start with and it cannot be because, for example, you don't do a manual buffer management, you have a garbage collection and you, have, you never forget a case because you can have algebraic data types to really let the compiler notice you if you forgot something. So yes, I, I definitely think so. More questions? Okay. Yes. Yes, that's exactly for restricting, for example, the read handle function has to be restricted to use uh, a configured handle. You cannot read from an unconfigured handle. And that's where the phantom types comes in because um, otherwise the, the compiler says, well, it's you, your parameter you parameterize the, fun uh, the function, but it says, well, but it also can be used in a more general way with any kinds of handle. So we have to hide that it's basically uh, the same type. And that's why, where you use phantom types. More questions? Um, actually, I'm not really sure if there's something um, comparable to polymorphic variants. There are basically constructors that you can um, compose. You don't have to have a type definition for them. You can just return them from a function, and then the return value of the function is, is a set of these constructors. And the, the, the constructors are always represented in the uh, signature. The, it just includes every kind of variant uh, of constructor that it can have. Um, and there's also um, different types. There's, you can, you can say, well, this function returns at exactly these constructors. You can, you can say it in the signature. Um, for example, here you see um, the signature is this thing, and it, this is a constructor, but it says, well, it, this, is, this is basically says it's a set. And there's different uh, types of sets. There's, it's uh, exactly these constructors, but this signature says, well, it's le at least this constructor. So it has at least a division, um, a division um, constructor, but it can also have more than these. But in this case, of course, there's just this one. You can, it can de de determine it statically. But you can say in your type signatures, you can say, I'm definitely sure that it's only these constructors. And if this function doesn't match the signature, the compiler will complain, well, it's, it's not the right, uh, your function does not return, for example, the overflow constructor, there's something wrong. But I'm not sure if there's a Haskell co um, a concept comparable to this. Yes, since um, 
OCaml had a, a minor version release, OCaml 4, and it's exactly that where, where they added GADTs. Hmm? <laughs> well, I haven't used GADTs very much because usually it's, you, can, you can go without. Um, but if you, if you need them, uh, they're, they're there, so. More questions? Okay, so thanks for coming and...